When one thinks of the Mafia in America, it usually evokes images of New York or Chicago. Rarely does one think of sunny California, and even less so the city of San Jose. Now the heart of Silicon Valley with its giant tech firms, it once had its own strange Mafia crime family that had a storied history markedly different to its larger cousins in the East. The early years of the Mafia in San Jose are shrouded in obscurity. Speaking decades later to the FBI, former San Francisco Mafia boss Anthony Lima recalled that on his arrival in the Bay Area in 1929, one Alfonso Canetto was the Mafia boss of San Jose, with Joseph Lentini possibly his underboss. He operated a small market on Vine Street and was believed by Lima to have been born in Sicily before moving to New York and eventually San Jose. His brother, a rancher and bootlegger near Modesto, was a made man in the San Francisco crime family. Upon his death sometime in the 1940s, Anofrio Sciortino became the new boss in San Jose, with Lentini continuing as underboss. Sciortino was a fruit buyer who reigned over the crime family until his death from natural causes in 1959. He did not, however, attend the Appalachian meeting in 1957, instead sending capo Joseph Cerrito in his place. Sciortino, along with four other crime family members, contributed $650 for Cerrito's travel expenses. On November 10, 1957, Cerrito flew to New York with San Francisco Mafia member and future boss James Lonza. Three days later, both men booked in at a Casey Hotel in Scranton, Pennsylvania, along with other guests Joseph Savello, Mafia boss of Dallas, Texas, Frank Desimone, boss of Los Angeles, and Simone Scazzari, underboss of Los Angeles. All the rooms and their accompanying charges were paid for by Russell Buffalino, the Mafia boss of Northeastern Pennsylvania. When the police interrupted the accompanying Appalachian meeting on the 14th, both Cerrito and Lonza managed to escape. Cerrito jumped over a fence and hid among bunches of weeds before heading home to San Jose by way of New Orleans. By managing to escape the roundup, Cerrito was able to mostly avoid any large-scale publicity, though he did have to appear before a federal grand jury in 1958, probing West Coast ties to the National Crime Syndicate. This was because the FBI were aware he had attended the convention at Appalachian and interviewed him soon after. However, he maintained he was in the New York area on legitimate business and refused to answer any questions relating to his stay in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Onofrio Sciortino died of natural causes in 1959, and Joseph Cerrito succeeded as boss of the family in San Jose. It's unclear what he had done to distinguish himself in order to be elected boss, but the reasons for the election of Frank Desimone in 1956 to the top of the Los Angeles crime family may have been similar. Desimone was a fully qualified attorney, to all outside observers a legitimate man with a clean police record. The membership of the L.A. family believed the election of such a boss would result in a low-key approach to business, with less violence and consequently less publicity. Desimone's capture at Appalachian had of course negated all of this, but Cerrito in San Jose was still an obscure figure to both the public and law enforcement. He was a legitimate car salesman with a prestigious Lincoln Mercury dealership, no criminal record, and he had not, like his unfortunate associate, been captured outright at the Appalachian summit. Joseph Cerrito was born in Sicily in 1911 before moving to the United States in 1920. He originally lived in Manhattan, New York with his parents where he was variously a photographer, salesman, and finally a butcher at his father's meat shop. He was distantly related to boss of the future Colombo family, Joseph Profasci, and while it was noted by an associate that he had been friendly with known gangsters, he didn't believe Cerrito had any involvement in illegal activities. His parents headed west in 1938, and in 1941, Joe followed, opening his own butcher shop in San Jose. Arriving at a time of a major meat shortage, Cerrito made a fortune thanks to his contacts with the Denver Meat Company, and after the war, used this money to go into the used car business, making several trips back to New York to buy used automobiles. A couple of years later, and he expanded to Los Gatos, acquiring a luxury Lincoln Mercury dealership, plus another lot to sell Edsel's. By 1957, the business was struggling, and this may explain the travel fund put together by Onofrio and the others to get him to the Appalachian meeting that year. The crime family of San Jose that Joseph Cerrito came to control in 1959 had a similar though somewhat different structure to other LCN families. At the top, there was of course the boss, who was the undisputed head of the family. 
He did, however, answer to the commission through Northern California's district head, Joe Bonanno. When Bonanno fell out with the commission during and after the Banana War, the San Jose family's point of contact for the commission becomes more confused. John Misaraca, a captain in New York's Colombo family, briefly was accorded the same status as Bonanno in the early 1960s, when he became heavily involved in the San Jose crime family's affairs. By 1967, orders from the commission were coming to Cerrito through Steve Magadino, LCN boss of the Buffalo, New York family. Below the boss, there may have been an underboss, the boss's second in command, who up until 1967 seems to have been Charles Carbone. Upon his death, however, the position may have been discontinued. One year after Carboni's death, an FBI report notes that there was no new underboss appointed, despite the fact that Emmanuel J. Figlia, Cerrito's brother-in-law, was widely believed to be the next in line. It seems that, despite the position possibly lapsing with Carboni's death in 1967, Figlia was in essence acting as a de facto underboss regardless. All complaints or problems were to be handled through him following Carboni's death. This brings us to the San Jose Mafia's counsel. The 1967 FBI report identifying Charles Carbone as underboss also identified not one, but two consiglieres. Soldier Salvatore Constanza, reporting on the structure of the San Jose Mafia in this period, speaks of Charles Carbone, plus Phil Marici and Steve Zaccoli, the two reputed consiglieres, as members of the Mafia's council. This elected group was made up of well-respected older members of the organization and had a say in the running of the crime family. As part of Constanza's induction, it was spelled out to him that no member could take action against another member without the okay of the council. All its members were reportedly soldiers, while Emmanuel Manny Figlia and Angelo Marino were identified as capos in charge of circles of soldiers rather than crews. Within the council, one member held the long-standing position of secretary, possibly akin to consigliere, while the family also had a gunsmith and an associate machinist who made silencers. In 1963, the estimated size of the family was 30 maid members split between two capos. Nearby San Francisco was estimated to have 12. The bulk of them in San Jose, though there was also a recognized subgroup in Modesto under soldier Frank Buffa. Meetings of the organization could involve up to 75 people, however, the majority of whom were undoubtedly associates such as the restaurant owner and close Cerrito confidant, Jack Allen. At initiation ceremonies, new recruits were assigned a godfather who pricked their finger, but it seems the position didn't have any further role beyond this. In 1956, one such ceremony took place at the California Cheese Company factory in San Jose, where Salvatore Constanza, Pete Misuraca, and Alex Camarada were inducted into the crime family. Salvatore Constanza later became an informant and recounted in 1963 his experience. Each man was taken into a room one at a time. A group of members from the San Jose and Modesto areas awaited him, with the words of his initiation delivered by Manny Figlia and Charles Carboni. He did not understand much of what was said, but likened the ceremony to a wedding. A sentence would be stated to him, and he would repeat it to those assembled. He remembered the word baptize being used, that he swore to have nothing to do with law enforcement, to uphold the organization over everything else, to do all in his power for it, and to never act against another member without the okay of the council. Throughout these vows, a picture of a saint was burned, and at the end, his godfather pricked his finger to draw blood. This induction ceremony lines up closely with that of other LCN families. However, another member turned informant, Frank Sorcy, recalled a very different, possibly earlier initiation. Source stated that when a member is brought into the organization, his index finger is pricked and allowed to bleed freely, and that in turn is matched with a cut or bleeding wrist of a member in the organization. In this way, they become blood brothers. The member, by using his wrist, is part of the growing tree. The finger has symbolism in that, like a sky on, it is grafted to the growing tree. It becomes part of it and is one. During this ceremony, a holy card consisting of a small picture of a saint is burned and a pledge of allegiance to the organization is made by the neophyte, putting the organization before himself, his family, and his religion. The neophyte is then kissed on both cheeks by the members. Once the ceremony was completed, other rules were immediately spelled out to the new recruits to report directly to their capo, to commit any crimes they are ordered to, and that they could not leave the organization except through death. 
$5 a month was to be paid to the organization and 10% of all illegal proceeds were to be kicked up to their capo. As Frank Scorsese stated in 1964, individuals are selected because they are shrewd and sharp in many ways, but are stupid in others. By this he meant that they were able to handle most situations, but were willing and able to follow the leadership blindly. Joe Cerrito's first major problem as boss was a long-standing extortion attempt. In 1954, Harold Smith Sr., wealthy owner of the casino Harold's Club in Reno, contacted a member of the San Jose crime family and agreed a murder contract on his stepmother for $100,000, worth over a million today. He later had a change of heart, however, and called off the murder, but the crime family in San Jose still wanted its due. A number of unsuccessful shakedowns followed involving prospective members Alex Camarada, Pete Misaraca, and Salvatore Constanza. Nothing came of them, yet despite their failure, all three men were nevertheless inducted. Cerrito was becoming increasingly impatient pushing for the collection of the debt, and in 1962 ordered Harold's murder if he continued to refuse to hand over the $100,000. He was concerned that the San Jose family was becoming a laughing stock, and that another crime family might decide to take over the collection for themselves. Cerrito was right to be worried. He was called to a meeting in Detroit in 1965 where he attempted to claim progress in the plot. But the LCN in New York and Detroit were debating taking over the extortion themselves, and Colombo capo John Musaraka was spearheading their interests in seeing the matter resolved. In 1966, he relocated to California to ensure the matter was settled. John felt a responsibility for the whole affair, as he had been the LCN sponsor for the three main men involved in the extortion plot, his brother Pete, son-in-law Alex Camarada, and Salvatore Constanza. John expressed frustration with the leaders and membership of the San Jose and San Francisco families, stating in 1964 that he had no faith in them as they were all too fat and satisfied with their present existence to do anything. He decided the money Harold owed no longer mattered and vowed to give the three men the leadership to finally settle the matter for good by murdering him. The plan was for John to pick the men up without warning and head for Reno. When you are going to do a job like this, you don't tell anybody ahead of time, not even God. His co-conspirators didn't take his advice to heart. Two of them were talking to the FBI. They interviewed Cerrito, Manny Figlia, and John Misaraca soon afterwards, telling them that they knew of their plans and not to act on them, while also insinuating clearly visible aggressive surveillance. It had the desired effect. John Misaraca became spooked and headed back to New York soon after. The first and most important informer we've already noted was Salvatore Constanza. The other was John's brother, Pete Misaraca, a madman who had once served in the U.S. Armed Forces before being discharged in 1942 as a psychotic. He lived on a disability pension and suffered from poor circulation of the blood in the lower extremities. Interviewed by the FBI in 1964, he freely stated his hatred for his brother John and his nephew-in-law, Alex Camarada. In 1962, his actions had caused a stir in the San Jose family after he was hospitalized in a delirious state, complaining of poor circulation in his legs, though hospital staff noted there was nothing wrong with him physically. He began talking aloud of crime family business to staff and patients, while also threatening to kill fellow soldier Frank Sorcy once he was out. The council quickly assembled to decide what to do, Joseph Cerrito quipping that Pete had poor circulation in the head. They hurriedly contacted Pete's brother John, but he angrily told them to solve the problem themselves. Manny Figlia, alongside his brother Vincenzo and Constanza, subsequently headed to the hospital to talk to Pete, but he was already discharged. Over a week later, he reappeared, reporting to Figlia and apologizing for his outburst, which he blamed on stress caused by fears that his legs were to be amputated. Amazingly, Cerrito and the others were willing to accept this apology and considered the matter settled, though John Misaraca continued to want his brother murdered for some time after. Despite, or perhaps because, of his unstable mental state, Pete divulged far less useful information than Constanza to the FBI, using his interviews more to voice his frustrations than anything else, which well fits his description by hospital staff as a chronic complainer. Other murder plots were afoot in San Jose during the 60s, and all similarly failed. 
In 1962, Angelo Marino received a contract from the Sicilian Mafia to kill Giuseppe Palomini, a.k.a. John Repepi, in retaliation for the murder of a Mafia member in Italy in 1956. Teaming up with San Francisco Mafia member Joseph Ginovese, San Jose soldiers Salvatore Constanza, Alex Camerata, Frank Sorsi, and Dominic Anzalone were sent to scout out Giuseppe, who was lying low working at a pizza parlor in Vacaville. Despite telling Constanza that Giuseppe could identify him, Angelo went to Vacaville and actually talked to his intended target, leading LA soldier Frank Bompensiero to believe he may have tipped the FBI about Giuseppe's whereabouts so that he could be picked up before any murder attempt would have to take place. Salvatore Constanza seems to be the more likely culprit behind the FBI's information, though fellow soldier Frank Sorsi was also an FBI informant and with Giuseppe's imprisonment and later deportation, the murder contract became redundant. The other contract once again involved Angelo Marino, an informant Salvatore Constanza. In 1967, Marino, as Constanza's superior, gave him a contract to kill caterer Joe Valencia over a $4,000 debt and unspecified personal reasons. Angelo had initially contacted Valencia's aunt, stating, if she did not pay, Valencia would be taken care of, but she replied bluntly that she couldn't care less. Constanza played along and secured a gun for the murder from Camerata, but he kept the FBI in the loop the whole way and Manny Figlia was forced to step in and cancel the contract due to the heat. Despite all three murder plots involving Constanza failing miserably due to police pressure, he was seemingly never suspected as an informant. The San Jose leadership were more concerned with FBI bugging than infiltration, and Angelo Marino suspected that it was Pete Misaraca, who, if anyone, was an informant. Another San Jose soldier, Gerald Joseph Gallo, later began staying at Los Gatos, avoiding San Jose entirely for fear of stool pigeons, but he could not name any one suspect. The same report notes that Dominic Anzalone was under suspicion by some, though he was not in fact an informant. Joe Cerrito does not seem to have actively involved himself in these other failed murder plots. He was instead busy dealing with a major legal case against Life magazine. In 1967, the magazine ran the first of a two-part series about the mob, with a small picture of Cerrito alongside other nationwide crime bosses. He received no other mention in the lengthy articles that followed, but was greatly disturbed by his public identification as the mafia boss of San Jose. The other LCN bosses were also disturbed by the details contained in the articles and decided one of their number needed to file a legal suit against the magazine in the hope that the proceedings would force life to reveal its sources for the information publicly. Steve Magadino, Mafia boss of Buffalo, New York, individually consulted with other members of the Mafia's commission and they decided that Cerrito was the perfect man to run a test case against the magazine. He had no criminal record, no substantial recorded mafia activity, and was perhaps the least well-known mafia boss in the country to both law enforcement and the public. Unfortunately for Joe, the suit backfired spectacularly. In 1968, the magazine, with the aid of the FBI and its information, responded to his legal case by running a full-length article on him and the Mafia in San Jose that ridiculed both Cerrito and the organization. It reported extensively on the failure of Giuseppe Palomini's murder, Cerrito's connections to the Commission and Sicilian Mafia, and of the Harold Smith extortion attempt. This caused great discontent among the crime family's membership for bringing lots of unwanted and unflattering publicity. As far away as Florida, Tampa Mafia boss Santo Traficante Jr. read of the crime family's ineptitude and believed a change in Northern California's LCN leadership was badly needed. At home in San Jose itself, the magazine was quickly selling out, so much so that crime family members had a hard time even getting a copy. Pete Misaraca dispatched his daughter to fetch him one, but when she asked a local shopkeeper for the magazine, he laughed, stating, Are you kidding? There's hardly a copy available in San Jose. Don't you know it features an article about our very own mafia in San Jose? When Pete did get his hands on one, he found he was mentioned prominently in relation to the Harold Smith extortion affair and enraged declared his intention to sue the magazine for $20 million. The blowback from the case would continue for many years, straining not just Cerrito's relationship to his crime family, but also to his immediate one. His wife and daughter were furious because of the publicity and the fact that he lost his relationship with Ford and thus his Lincoln Mercury car dealership due to his now public Mafia membership. The entire affair with life and the consequent publicity 
took a toll on Cerrito's health and enthusiasm to be boss. By 1972, he was so concerned over law enforcement harassment that he avoided contact with any other Mafia members, causing great discontent among his capos. Other Mafia leaders were also beginning to take advantage of the San Jose crime family's weakness. Joe Bonanno Sr. and his son Bill were planning a move to the city in 1974, asking Lonza to back their takeover and gaining the support of San Francisco soldier Anthony Lima in setting up. Jimmy Fratiano of the Los Angeles family was also making clear his own intentions to take over Mafia activities in Northern California. That wasn't a problem in San Francisco at least, Fratiano lived there and was the most active LCN member in the city. Since as early as 1962, Fratiano had a very low opinion of the two Northern Californian crime families, and in 1974 disparagingly referred to the San Francisco Mafia as them three old men with Lonza. The nominal boss, James Lonza, was noted in an FBI report of the same year, has been inactive in LCN matters for the past few months. There is no indication that Lonza is involved in any illegal activity. Thus, in 1975, Fratiano was attempting to contact Lonza and tell Lonza that he, Fratiano, desires to take over in Northern California. He indicated to informants that he may contact people back east and have them contact Lonza regarding his desires to take over. Soon after, on the 26th of February, 1975, the FBI San Francisco office received an anonymous phone call. I am calling from LA. Figley and Lonza are going to be hit by Redacted, who is an ex-Green Beret. Redacted has three guys helping him. The hit will be in San Francisco and San Jose. That's it, man. You're not tracing this call. The FBI took the threat seriously enough to begin investigating, warning Figlia of the threat to his life the very next day, but they were unable to locate James Lonza. The man mentioned in the call was interviewed in Denver, Colorado, but denied any knowledge of the hit. The FBI file noting he had never been a Green Beret, but merely a U.S. Army member who had deserted three times, and denied ever making the call or even knowing who Figlia or Lonza were. Figlia did his own investigations and decided the whole thing was a big joke, but acknowledged to an informant that he knew who was behind the threat. Lonza was not reached by the FBI until the 10th of March, but he was surely informed of the threat on his life beforehand. Lonza believed it was Jimmy Fratiano who was behind the murder threat in the hopes of scaring Lonza, the boss of San Francisco, and Figlia, the heir to Joe Cerrito, to accept his takeover of the Mafia in Northern California. Fratiano naturally denied this, but the evidence at least suggests him as the most likely culprit behind the conspiracy. The call was made from Southern California where Jimmy had many associates. The caller was a Mexican-American, and Jimmy was known to have ties to the Mexican Mafia, whom he later tried to use to kill the LA Mafia leadership after his fall from grace in the late 70s. In terms of motive, Fratiano had expressed interest in Northern California since 1962 when he, in a conversation with fellow LA soldier Frank Bompensiero, stated, Guys in San Francisco and San Jose wouldn't last two minutes if some real workers moved into their towns. We ought to come in and take over both towns. Knock off a couple of guys, scare the rest shitless. Bompensiero chuckled, Yeah, Jimmy, we could bring in some good men and rule the roost. Someday, Jimmy said, I might just do that. Although it was already bad enough to have the Bananos and Fratiano attempting to move in on San Jose, the Chicago outfit was also beginning to have a more noticeable presence in the area, adding further to the anxiety amongst the San Jose members. For there was by 1975 a strong desire among the San Jose membership for an election to name a new boss. Cerrito had successfully used the fear of law enforcement surveillance to forestall any large-scale meetings of the crime family's members for several years by this point although he was certain that if an election were to occur, he would be ousted. Capo Manny Figlia was named his most likely successor, and Cerrito confided to Lanza in 1975 that he intended to resign before any election was ever held, to save himself the embarrassment of being removed. We have no evidence, however, that he did in fact step down before his death in 1978, and he may have continued to successfully stall any election efforts. With Joseph Cerrito's death from natural causes in 1978, we must ask who succeeded him. A quick glance at the San Jose crime family's Wikipedia page says that Capo Angelo Marino became the new boss in San Jose, although Figlia was in the past Cerrito's most likely successor. 
1978 report on organized crime in California gives conflicting statements on Angelo's position. On his own entry, he is described as a high-level member of the San Jose Mafia for many years. But in another entry on one of his associates, it states, Angelo Marino, named by the U.S. Congressional Record as the leader of the San Jose Mafia. Now, the report was released in May of that year, while Joe Cerrito did not die until September. This means that either Cerrito was in fact ousted before his death, and that Marino was elected in his place, or the report itself was wrong to label him as the leader, and instead should have called him one of the leaders of San Jose Mafia. It seems that the congressional record report they were referring to is in fact from 1969, which they'd already referenced, and names him as a captain in the San Jose Mafia rather than outright boss. If an election had been held before Cerrito's death in 1978, it was instead Manny Figlia that should have succeeded. He had been acknowledged by informants and the FBI as the second highest ranking member behind Cerrito since as early as 1967, and indeed just three years before the latter's death was seen as the next in line to replace him, also having the backing of the nearby San Francisco family. However, when Jimmy Fratiano became a government witness in 1978, Figlia may have decided to avoid the top position altogether. If an election was ever held after Cerrito's death, Figlia might have bowed out, but it does seem unlikely that Angelo would have been selected as boss as well. He was at the time facing enormous publicity from a failed double murder in 1977 that would last right up until his death in 1983 and beyond. According to police sources, Manny Figlia was the most senior member by 1987, but in the same report, the boss position is listed as vacant, so who, if anyone, succeeded Cerrito is unclear. That's not to say that Angelo Marino was not an important mafia figure in San Jose. He was, arguably, their most active, though not necessarily successful, member. His father, Salvatore Marino Sr., had been a made man in the Pittsburgh crime family before transferring to San Jose and opening the California Cheese Company. He had originally been a capo, but was forced to step down by boss Joseph Cerrito over disagreements between the two. Salvatore agreed to resign only if his young son could take his place. Cerrito accepted this compromise, and thus Angelo Marino became a capo. Though this undoubtedly pleased Angelo and his father, other LCN members were less impressed. In a 1964 meeting between San Jose council member Steve Zicoli and San Francisco boss James Lonza, both men agreed he had been too young when promoted, and they doubted if he could successfully withstand FBI pressure. Similarly, Tampa Mafia boss Santo Traficante Jr. described him as a very weak man who could not kill anyone if his own life depended on it, and that he had no talent whatsoever for LCN racket activity, that most of his adult life was spent chasing women and gambling while his father had to run the California Cheese Company. It's certainly true that Angelo had a weakness for women. He was almost killed over one. His first wife was a sister of the Maggio brothers from the Philadelphia crime family, and his long affair with girlfriend Maria Mack caused him lots of trouble in the 60s. First, in 1962, he was threatened with a beating sanctioned by Cerrito, who, along with other LCN members, was openly disgusted at Angelo's adultery, one member remarking Angelo's head would look like a block of mozzarella cheese if he didn't fall in line. Later in 1964, he was perilously close to being murdered by the Maggio brothers for the affair which was causing disgrace to his wife's family. His life was only spared thanks to the intervention of John Misaraka. Angelo Marino and Precious Maggio would later divorce in 1966. John Misaraka was not Angelo's only useful connection. He and his father were known to be close friends to San Francisco boss James Lanza, and later San Francisco mayor Joseph Aliotto. Aliotto was related to members of the Milwaukee crime family, and also through marriage to members of the Dallas crime family. His father-in-law was said by an informant to have been an LCN member, killed by the mob in Texas. He originally started his career as an attorney, variously representing, among others, San Francisco soldier Anthony Lima. Aliotto and Angelo were described as being like brothers. On one occasion in the early 1960s, Aliotto returned home to find his wife waiting for him, holding a shotgun. She had found out about an affair he was having behind her back and pumped off around at Aliotto that missed as he quickly fled the house. The man he turned to for help was Angelo Marino, who, with the help of James Lanza, reconciled the couple. 
Alioto was a strong supporter of Democratic presidential candidate Hubert Humphreys, and after he narrowly lost the 1968 election to Nixon, still continued to back the former vice president. As mayor, he made trips in support of Humphreys during the 1972 Democratic primaries to Milwaukee, accompanied at these political beatings by Milwaukee Mafia members John Alioto and Peter Balistrieri. He also convinced Angelo Marino to donate to Humphrey's cause, though he would eventually lose the primaries and Angelo's chance of a connection to the White House. Marino would use his close relationship with Alioto to his financial advantage too. Firstly, despite having a criminal record, he was able to obtain, through Alioto's influence, a $247,000 loan from the Small Business Administration for his cheese company, a figure worth around $2.5 million today. Later, when Alioto opened his own bank, Angelo stored money with him and thus gained access to extremely low interest loans. He also introduced his associate, Jimmy Fratiano, who was at the time with the Chicago outfit, to Alioto. This would lead in 1965 to an attempt to buy into the Crystal Bay Casino at Lake Tahoe by Angelo and Jimmy, who hoped to use Alioto's bank to raise $2.3 million for the investment. This deal was eventually shot down by Chicago soldier Frank Laporte, who believed Alioto was driving too hard a bargain in return for the loan. A second opportunity arose for both men with the Tally Ho Casino in Vegas, but yet again the deal would eventually fall through, with Angelo and Jimmy both losing $35,000 that they had initially invested. It was in legitimate business that he was most successful. In 1963, both he and his father were valued at 248,572 and 221,288 dollars respectively, giving Angelo alone a net worth of around 2.5 million dollars in today's value. The bulk of this was undoubtedly due to the California Cheese Company, which operated factories not just in San Jose, but across the state. This success allowed Angelo to expand further into legitimate endeavors. In 1964, he purchased another cheese factory at Rockford, Illinois, and opened a pizza parlor in San Leandro, California. His company benefited from his family's LCN connections, doing business with the Bonanno-aligned Allied Food Distributors while having close connections to other cheese businesses across the country. Relative through marriage, a fellow San Jose crime family member, Anthony Maggio, owned the nearby Mason Cheese Corporation, while his one-time father and brother-in-law owned M. Maggio Cheese Company in Philadelphia. LCN infiltration of the industry was so acute that a report of the study of organized crime's infiltration of the pizza and cheese industry was published in 1980. What Angelo is most notorious for is the attempted double murder of father and son Orlando and Peter Catelli in 1977. Peter Catelli was a 24-year-old who applied for work at the California Cheese Company, but when his application was rejected, he decided it was a good idea to extort Angelo, a mafia capo, for $100,000 in order to pay off gambling debts. Peter's father Orlando Catelli was summoned to the cheese factory for a meeting with Angelo, his son Salvatore Marino Jr., soldier Joseph Piazza, and mutual associate Thomas Napolitano. The elder Catelli apologized for his son's conduct, but Peter continued to threaten Angelo on the phone at a subsequent meeting the next day. Orlando managed to convince his son to come in for a sit-down where he was searched, questioned, and beaten. Orlando was then escorted by Piazza and Napolitano into an adjoining room where the plot to scare Peter Catelli was undone. The plan was to shoot around into a box of cheese, making Peter think that his father had been killed in an effort to scare him. Instead, the accounts differ, one of the two things happened. Either Peter, enraged at his father's apparent execution, went for the gun only to be shot down for real by Angelo, or Salvatore Jr., not fully informed of his father's plan, believed Orlando had been murdered and decided to take out Peter too. Either way, Orlando rushed into the room and fell at the body of his dead son, whereupon Salvatore decided to finish the job and shot him once in the back of the head. Both bodies were packed into the boot of Orlando's Cadillac, while an unidentified driver known only as Andy was told to dump the car at Oakland Airport. He instead got lost and abandoned the car in the middle of San Francisco where Orlando, who was not actually dead, banged on the trunk until he was found. The resulting case would drag on for 14 years with several retrials taking place. Angelo died during the second in 1983. Napolitano was acquitted. Joseph Piazza served three years while Salvatore Marino ended up with nine. 
As author Ovid Damaris noted on the Catelli murder, the San Jose family had finally done some work, but true to form, they had botched it up. As noted before, by 1987, Manny Figlia was listed as the most senior LCN member of the San Jose family. He wouldn't die until 2009 at the age of 91, by which time he had long been retired. The last real info we have on their activities comes from a 1992 FBI report that states, the San Jose LCN family, to include maid members and associates, continue to operate in the San Francisco Bay Area. The San Jose LCN family continues to be loosely affiliated, with no one individual acting as the leader or head of the family. It appears that members and associates continue to commit fraud, including bank fraud, loan sharking, extortion, and possibly the investment of illicit money into legitimate businesses. The report mentions both Salvatore Marino Jr. and soldier Joseph Piazza, but focuses more heavily on the Bonanos in the area, and it's unclear if the report actually differentiates between this Bonanno faction and the Cerrito crime family when talking about the LCN family of San Jose. Salvatore Marino is noted to be serving time after the fourth and final Catelli murder trial, while he was later sentenced to a further four years in 1994 for possessing a 357 caliber revolver, 30 caliber rifle, and a 22 caliber Derringer at his home. He maintained he was holding all firearms for a friend. Joseph Piazza was noted in the report for his frequent phone calls from San Jose with the boss of the Philadelphia crime family. He died in 2005. It's easy to see that the San Jose crime family were not very good at actually committing crimes, and it's worth asking were they involved in any money-making illegal activity at all? The answer is no, not really. FBI reports from 1964 and 1967 note of both the San Francisco and San Jose crime families that there is no evidence to indicate that any of the members are involved in any type of illegal or criminal activities nor do they control or operate any type of racket operation. Apart from the failed extortion and murder attempts already mentioned, the San Jose crime family did not, as an organization, attempt any illegal activity. Nearby bookmakers were allowed to operate tax-free for fear of drawing police attention. Attempts at union infiltration were half-heartedly made. Angelo Marino was charged in 1963 with gaining control of unions covering the wine and sugar industries in California. And despite contacts with their head, Gene Buffalino, nothing seems to have come of them. Instead, any illegal activity was conducted at an individual level. Frank Sorcy was a noted bookmaker in Redwood City. Joseph Piazza was a part of a successful burglary crew. Dominic Anzalone was a noted gambling head, while Vito Francandragna was another noted bookmaker suspected of fixing horse races in Northern California. The crime family more closely resembled a business cooperative than a mafia family. The majority of its members owned small to medium-sized businesses, with Marinos being the most successful. One member, referring to police pressure in 1968, summed the whole thing up well when he said, Why don't they leave us alone and go after those guys back east who are making all the money in the rackets? We try to make an honest living here and they keep bothering us. 